So uh, please feel free to ask questions as, as I speak. And if you don't ask me questions, I'll try to ask you questions. If that doesn't really make sense. Uh, so most of my work, this work I'm going to present mm -hmm. was done by Jason Carter as part of his PhD thesis. And uh, Judy Long and Kevin Wong were two undergrads who furthered that work. So I'll, I'll talk about all the drugs uh, that they came up with too. So uh, this work falls in many areas. One of them is emotion-based software engineering, where you're trying to figure out the emotions of people who are programmed. Okay, and there's a lot of emotions you can uh, try to mine. Happiness, frustration, interruptibility. And the one we're going to focus on is facing difficulty. So can we figure out whether somebody is having difficulty uh, without them telling us explicitly? So why would you do that? Uh, so the idea is that if somebody's in difficulty and they haven't articulated that to you and there's an algorithm that detects their difficulty and not only detects it but conveys it to some, some uh, collaborator. And what can the collaborator do with that information? Okay. The collaborator can perhaps provide help and through the collaboration environment uh, come, up with, come up with a way of providing the help figure out whether they need help and then provide the help. And that's, that's, that's the real motivating, um, um, the dri driving problem here. But there are many other things that the collaborator could also uh, do with that inference. In fact, let me ask you guys, if you knew that one of your collaborators was in difficulty, how could that be useful to you besides perhaps providing help? And I, I'm not asking to test you, I'm asking you to know because you guys are the real practitioners, I'm just being academic. Sorry? Okay, so one is to provide help. Anything else? Excellent. So you could you could reassign the person? Or you could perhaps do something with the task. Okay. And anything else? Yeah. So also if you're saying uh, you get uh, it's also you're trying to make sure that researchers are aware of certain pain points that can cause you and are better equipped to do the training. Excellent. So you could you could you could use that to improve your training material so that next time such a difficulty doesn't arise. Divide your task into smaller tasks so that it typically doesn't arise. Okay. Anything else? So, great. I mean, I'm, I, I'm recording this, so next time I give this talk, I'll have more points to uh, give. Uh, but uh, you could change your expectations. If you're a manager and you see that the programmer is having difficulty, maybe you, you now know that the product will not be shipped at the, at the correct time. 
And I've heard this, especially given this emphasis, I've heard from people that certain cultures, and India being Indians being one of them, uh, people don't like to admit they're in difficulty. So it's good to know whether they're in difficulty or not, uh, because then you can you can uh, change expectations about about what's happening. Um, if somebody's in difficulty, perhaps, what do you guys think? Would the program have more? Is the program likely to have more bugs or less bugs? Uh, more bugs. But you know, most accidents occur when you're uh, approaching home. So sometimes when you're scared, you have fewer bugs. So I don't know. It could go by to both ways, but you could change your expectations about bugs too. And, and, and so you could, you could inspect the code more carefully or less carefully. If you're an academic, you could have a special lesson or in training materials, especially you could change your training materials so that next time you don't have these difficulties. Uh, you could change the assignment, like you said, break it up into smaller parts. And again, change assignment, change lecture, change training materials. So there's lots of things you can do if you could magically figure out somebody's having difficulty, okay? But like I said, we'll just focus on the most, um, uh, perhaps the most useful one, which help the person with the difficulty. Okay, I come from a collaboration environment, so, I, so this, this, this is a natural extension of <coughs> Providing a distributed collaboration environment where you're actually inferring difficulties rather than being told them. Okay. So, um, so opportunistic help. So it's not that I'm providing you help when you come to me for my next weekly meeting, but providing you help when you need it. Okay. So this is opportunistic collaboration. And just to show the system working, here's a person. They're in difficulty. The system detects that they're making slow progress or they're in difficulty. Information is conveyed to somebody saying that, hey, so-and-so is having difficulty, I changed the name. And they run into, uh, they have a dialogue and you see at the end of the dialogue where the person is actually thanking the person who helped. So this is a real system that has been used, used and this was a lab study in which it was used. Okay, so this gives you an idea of what our goal is. So there are many, many issues that are raised by this goal. How, what do we really mean by this goal? That's one of the toughest parts of this issue here. Uh, and uh, providing help seems like a nice altruistic thing, but you know, from, a, from the bottom line point of view or from an educational point of view, it's really useful. Uh, I'll go through these questions when I address them. Let me just start with the first one. So uh, this is a problem with any uh, um, effective computing problem that how do we really figure out whether the human is facing a particular emotion, okay? So let's see what other people, what people have done for other emotions like interruptibility and frustration and difficulty before. So this is some work done at CMU and what they did was they're trying to figure out whether somebody is interruptible or not. So at random times they went and gave them a problem to solve and if they solved the problem within a certain time, uh, they were interruptible, otherwise they were not interrupted. So basically they were randomly interrupting the, the human to figure out their emotion. As it turns out, that doesn't quite work for difficulty because if the training material is good, if you're well suited to the task, uh, the random interruption is unlikely to find difficulty. Difficulty is going to be rare. Okay, so, so difficulty, um, and we did some experiments here to show what the relative uh, um, periods were that were making progress and making slow progress, and uh, difficulty was, was a very small factor. Okay? So you're going to find needles in a haystack, and, and so random interruption is not going to do it. Okay, if programmer is matched to the task, we're assuming that we begin with good training material, we assign somebody a task they can do. Another thing is to just ask them to always press a button when they have some, some emotion that is uh, abnormal. So this was some work done at Microsoft Research, in fact, by a guy called Kapoor. Okay. And there was, this, was, this was a game designed, uh, this was a Tower of Hanoi problem designed for kids. And the kid went and pressed, I'm frustrated, I'm having difficulty when they, they were supposed to do that. Uh, and the problem here is that you can forget to indicate state. Okay, if you're in difficulty, you're so obsessed with trying to figure out what's going on, you do not press the button. Okay. And another potential problem is that you may under-report difficulties. Um, I said that in certain cultures, that's the case. Actually, certain individuals are like that, too. 
and there's some work to sort of back that up that people tend to often not report to the police. Okay. First problem we try to solve by doing the following. This is the following hypothesis. You may forget to go and indicate your status, but if somebody tells you this is your status, you'll probably correct that. Okay? So what we said was that we'll run a difficulty algorithm in the background. It can be a stupid algorithm, it doesn't matter. But every now and then it'll go and make an inference. And, and, if, and if the inference is wrong, you correct. Okay? So that is the way we've actually uh, figured out if somebody's difficulty or not. And we, of course, have the problem that you may underreport the difficulties. And our that is to also record actions when we can record actions <coughs> and have some third party observer indicate whether the person was at dif in difficulty at a particular point. Okay? Now, if you have 40 hours or 50 hours of videos, you're not going to be able to see all the videos. So we actually didn't quite have the observers see every instance. We had them confirm the difficulty points that the, the user gave or our, our algorithm gave, and then we told them to sub look, at, look at some random points. So this also is not perfect. Okay. So like I said, here's a tool we built to allow observers to actually uh, figure out whether some, some worker was. So we, has, we have a field study, and there were no screen recordings there to view, so we, we have to rely on the corrections. Uh, we have some lab studies where we have screen recordings, where we use both developers and observers' information. And there were some lab studies where the developers weren't given a chance to change uh, their status. So we all, all, all we have are observers, observer information. So this just shows you this uh, as to how to figure out if somebody's in difficulty or not. And we use the combination of observer, observer judgment and, and developer corrections to figure out whether somebody's in difficulty. Okay? Questions so far? Okay, so your question is, did we consider having a heartbeat monitor or some other measure to figure out if they're in difficulty or not? Yeah. And, and uh, so that, is, that comes to the algorithm itself, because even we have to figure out whether that heartbeat monitor is consistent with what the first somebody, what the ground truth is. That's also going to make an inference. Okay, that's, there's, no, there's no science behind, uh, you know, there's no scientific result that says that this kind of heartbeat is going to cause difficulties. So there are people who've done that, that kind of work, and I'll show you some that we've done also. But we still need the inference. So I'll, I'll get into the algorithms later. Okay. Yeah. So, so again, there are all these indirect measures that can indicate difficulties. But you know, there are cool and composed people. You, you know, I, I heard that Infosys supports ATP tennis. And if you think of tennis, and if you're old enough like me, you know a guy called Bjorn Borg who had a pulse rate of 42 and never got flustered, ever. No matter whether he was losing or winning. So it was not that McEnroe was not beating him up and he was not in difficulty, he just didn't show it. So there are certain people who, who, are, who are composed, who might be in difficulty, but have no external manifestations of it. So you still need to have ground truth, and then you figure out what, your, what are some indirect inferences So, so our definition, let's go in, so we haven't, I haven't even talked about my algorithm. My difficulty detection system says that either you said you're in difficulty or, and or an observer said you're in difficulty. If you were playing, the observer could sort of figure that out perhaps, okay? And if you were playing, you won't have your stress go up and your heartbeat go up. So uh, maybe your heartbeat goes up when you're, when, you're, when you're getting the answers too, right? It's excited, here it comes.
Okay, so let me just go one point at a time. Let's try to figure out what difficulty, the difficulty is, then we'll try to figure out what I try to do. But uh, there's, there's uh, pretty much nobody else doing programming difficulty. So this is an this is, um, untrodden area. So most of the questions you guys have, I probably say, I don't know. Okay, uh, that, that's beyond. But let's just see what, what I have. And then we'll see. Right now we're just trying to figure out what difficulty is and we're having difficulty defining what difficulty is. Okay, which, which is a nice recursive, which is nice recursive thing to happen in computer science. So, uh, so uh, before we go to all of this stuff, I mean, who cares if somebody's in difficulty because we really provided them with help. So let's, let me ask you this question. I mean, it's altruistic to be helpful, but you know, s selfishness is the Darwinian way to go. So um, what do you guys think in, a, in an industry? Um, so let's go, I think I have a slide here. So here's the devil's advocate in me. He's saying that in a company, if I'm helping you, that my own work is being stopped. So you know, is that good? And uh, if I tell you the answer, I mean, you're playing around and you're learning, and I tell you, do this, you didn't learn, okay? So let's, and, and these are the two motivations, industrial work and educational work are the two motivations for our work. So let's talk about industry first. What do you guys think? Should you help your co uh, coworker or should you just obsess with your own task? Yeah. So you're saying the company, you, you might become more dispensable, but the company will benefit if your knowledge is spread out. And as an educationist, you know, this is called the multiplier effect. I train you, you train somebody else, and we spread the knowledge rather than just be focused. Anybody want to counter that? I mean. So you're spreading knowledge, and that's good, right? Also for yeah. So, uh, so, uh, so previous work has investigated this problem in an indirect way, and so has ours in a very preliminary. Way. So these are your opinions. Here are some papers, and these papers all back what you guys are saying. In fact, they back the kind of work environment you have. Anybody who feels that they don't have an office is, is going to feel very happy after the results I show you. After I show you. So people have uh, compared productivity in teams that are co-located in, 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 in some geographic area, say in, in this building, third and fourth floor, and teams that are spread out. And the productivity of teams that are spread out is, despite all the collaboration technology that people like me have built and talked about, their productivity is low. Okay. And why is it lower? Who really knows? When you say low, how low? What do you mean by low? Uh, you know, you have to read that paper. Uh, this is a CMU paper, uh, but there, it was lower. It, it was significant. As far as an academic is concerned, if it's, if it's statistically lower, it's lower. Okay. And uh, the only factor they found correlating with that was the perception a person had of getting help from their team members. Percept so when they uh, interviewed people, everybody felt that they, they um, helped co-located and remote helpers equally. But the remote helpers felt that they were uh, helped uh, less than um, the co-located workers. That was correlation, not causality. But it may be causality. Yeah. That also may stem back to communication between those collaborative tools and the effort and team versus the model. Right, so the collaboration tools may not have been good enough. But this was actually help beyond the uh, call of duty, where you go out of your way to help. And, and So th these guys looked at all of these factors 
and found that this was the most correlated, which is kind of counterintuitive. So one should read the paper to find out how much more, and you guys should read the papers to figure out you know, whether which factors were the most, but they were the most obvious factors that I, I would have guessed, like communication, uh, uh, water cooler chats, but it turned out the, the perception of receiving help, not the perception of giving help, was the one that most correlated. Okay, so this was co-located meant, you know, you could all be in cubicles, you could be on third floor, fourth floor, but you're in the same building. You come to the same cafe to have, 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 have the same water, and so you have water cooler talks. Then they also, folks at Michigan compared co-located teams that are radically co-located versus not radically co-located. So what you guys have here is radically co-located. That means you're all in one bull, big bullpen where you can uh, sense each other. And, and a reason, and again, they found that the productivity in these radically co-located rooms was higher. Why was it higher? Lots of reasons possible, but one, 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 one reason that, that, uh, that uh, they gave was the fact that in radical co-location, you could sense when people were in difficulty as you walked by their um, seat and help them if they needed. Okay. So that again um, reinforces, okay, and how many of you guys are in spare programming? You're into it? So. Whenever possible, I like to do spare programming, but a lot of people don't like it because it will fix the whole circuit. Okay, so that's the whole thing. That two people working on a task, so it's twice as many man, much manpower as one person working on a task, right? And, and, and so at NC State, there's. Laurie Williams, who was actually at Utah at that time when she did this work, and she did a study where she tried to figure out the productivity of, of pairs versus in, uh, people working alone. And indeed, the pairs took more person months to finish the job, job but they had fewer bugs. And then they, they calculated the cost of fixing bugs, and based on the cost of fixing bugs, they found that the productivity of pair program was Actually, the, the, they had 15% uh, fewer bugs, and, and to track a bug takes a lot of time, yeah. so it was far more. They, the numbers they used were far more. more. It was 15% mo more person hours, yeah. and 15% less fewer bugs. But they figured out that it cost much more time to fix a bug than to, to create a bug. Right? Okay. So reduce bugs in Things. So what we are learning is, if we compose these studies together, that the productivity of developers increases when they help each other, and as distance and programmer coupling increases, help is offered less. Okay. So difficulty, it's good, it seems we are on the right track, but what we are doing is a very different kind of collaboration. It's not fair programming where you know what each other, person is doing, it's not distance collaboration where you're perhaps talking abstractly about a problem. It's more like radical co-location where you see somebody's in difficulty, you figure out what the problem is, the context is, and then you give them help. But radical co-location, you're co-located, we're talking of perhaps being distributed. So I'm helping perhaps the person in Arizona with the problem they have uh, because my, the system can, can sense the person in Arizona, figure out that they're in difficulty and convey to me in Chapel Hill or in or in this place, okay? So that's a different kind of world. So uh, the previous work um, is, you know, and your in all instincts um, uh, uh, say that productivity should be better, but it was correlation versus cause, no comparison of productivity with and without help, isolating just the help factor, okay? And uh, the kind of collaboration we're talking about was not explained. So we did a little study and try to figure out what kind of context is needed for somebody to come up to date when, when they're involved. And um, how much time is used to resolve a difficulty with and without opportunistic help. And, and how, how much, when, when somebody has difficulty, how, how significant is the, is, is, is the help you provide? If you're working on a thousand line program, you know, do you provide them a hundred lines of code or one line of code? So we try to figure that out in, for, some, for some tasks. And Talking of context, so again, I tell you, I, I come from a CSCW world, and providing context to one to help me is like 
while entering a, a meeting day where something has already progressed and he has to be made up to date. See? So it's a latecomer problem. And that latecomer problem has been, and I'm going to talk about a work at Microsoft Research that was actually led by an ex-PhD student of mine. And that is the state of the art here uh, in this area, where they have basically replayed the actions that occurred in the meeting to help a latecomer uh, come up. And, and they replayed the shared workspace, the video, audio, and they tried to figure out which is the most useful mechanism. And they found that replaying the shared workspace was the least useful. And, um, our scenario is, is a similar yet different. In the classic scenario, you've got, uh, you join a non-private multi-person meeting. So when you join a meeting late, there's at least been some other person, at least two people before who have been in the meeting. So you have some audio to capture, you have some video to capture, something has happened. And in our case, you're entering a one-person meeting. The person was alone, there was no audio, there was no, there's nothing to, nothing to really understand what was going on. And it was an unscheduled time versus a scheduled time with the latecomer, so we don't have all these other modalities. So the, all we have is shared workspace that was the least useful thing in the latecomer problem at MSR when we studied it. And the metric there is, can you recall the information that was disseminated during the meeting? Here the metric is, can you solve the problem this person was having? And did you understand the problem? And what was the issue? Yeah, because you entered a single person meeting. So there are different metrics here. And we'll talk about later. Uh, but we did an experiment and we gave them some problems to solve and we used ACM programming context problems which have a known level of difficulty. And uh, what we did was, what we could have done was actually have live workers and observers in the experiment and see what happens. Uh, but if you do that, you can't, uh, you can't have repeatability. See? Um, and uh, you can't get comparative data. And we need a system. So we're trying to motivate the system, and we need a system to motivate the system, right? We need a system to provide help, to motivate it. So we did an experiment similar to what was done in MSR. We used recordings to figure out what was happening. And uh, if you're going to provide help to somebody, you should, be, you should know something about the problem. So you should be an expert. So we had to somehow create experts who could help. And you had to create people who needed help. And we did that in two phases. We first had a bunch of people do, this, uh, do, do the problem so that they could become experts and have difficulty, okay? Then the same people went and reviewed the difficulties of others, okay? So here, the leftmost person did this task and had a difficulty, and the others went and looked at the recording and, and tried to figure out whether they could help with the difficulties that the person had. So they weren't doing it live, but they wanted to know how much context was needed to provide the help, how long did it take to get there, And, and these guys were experts now on the problem, so hopefully that should take less time than it took to the, to the worker, okay? And this mimics the situation we have in classrooms where an LA or TE has taken the course first and then they have to help somebody, or a mentor has knows what's going on and is helping an intern, so the mentor is the expert and the intern is the one helping. Okay. So, uh, so that's the experiment setup. Uh, it's not live, like I said. And uh, there were nine in student and five industrial programmers who took part in the study. Um, so while they were solving the task, our tool actually did predict their status. Uh, there was an initial version of the tool. And Jason, who was the PhD student here, ma uh, manually inferred other difficulties. So we had the list of difficulties in the developer phase. And there were lots of hours uh, of. And uh, uh, how do we know that the expert could have helped? They're not really helping the developers. So they had to go and write down the solution to each difficulty. So each difficulty, they had to write down what they thought was the difficulty to see whether they could really come to speed with the problem and they could actually solve it. Okay. And how did it write? Well, we had two coders that went and, who went and looked at the expert's solution to see whether the solutions were correct. Okay, who were who were experts in that problem? Okay, so that's the experimental setup. And what did we find? That, that the experts could solve about 50% of the problems. Okay. They said it glass is half full or it's half empty. Right. So the glass half empty means that um, 
you know, half the time offering help is a waste of time. That means it's good for the uh, expert to learn the context before they really go and provide help. You should really get to know, and hopefully that shouldn't take them too much time, okay? And they were given just five minutes of the video around the difficulty. So the, 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 the glass half full is that five minutes of context was enough to solve the problem. Okay, so that, that shows that that's, that's good news. And um, how much time, so these difficulties, remember difficulty may be temporary and they get solved. In fact, all difficulties are temporary. We give them, we give the person in, in finite time, they're probably solved. It's always relative to some deadline. Right? So um, it, it took the developers about 16 minutes and 30 seconds to solve the problem on their own. It took the um, expert eight minutes without help from the developer. If they were to work together, it would have probably taken less. Okay? So that gives you some numbers. Now, this is a very small experiment, so don't take this number too seriously. How we set up the experiment is interesting because if we, can, we can come up with much larger experiments to sort of figure out what's really going on. Thing because they could go and look at the context multiple times. Okay. We had two conditions. In one condition, they could only look at the context once. In the second condition, they could look at it multiple times. And uh, in the second condition, they took a little bit more time, but they were more correct. They felt more confident about it about this. Okay. And um, ninety-one percent of the solution problems were one line. We cannot relate to this. I mean, I have spent two days trying to track down the problem, and it was just a stupid one line where I missed a curly brace or I changed, you know. So, sorry. Just a colon into my colon. Well, no, semicolon colon. I think yes. I, I, I haven't faced that problem. But uh, you but. Use JavaScript then. Sorry. You don't use JavaScript. Oh God, who's going to use JavaScript? <laughs> I mean, JavaScript. I'm surprised that you like anything like that. No, I'm talking of Java with all its type checking, static type checking. So, uh, so this is this, so this this is again, okay, um, um, and this is consistent with previous study. So that's good. Okay, um, so um, that's the results from this particular. So what about uh, this is what about learning? So answer his question: Should we help somebody with difficulty, or let them throw them in the pool and see whether they can swim or not? Okay, and, and throw a life. Jacket at the very last moment. Uh, so, what do you guys think? Would pe people learn more or less with the help? Depends on the behavior. Depends on the individual. So it, it does depend, but you know, if you guys have to go and say on average or in general, what do you guys think? And so you have to you have to make a choice. Yeah. Yeah. So that's so that's going to a forum to get Stack Overflow. Yeah. Is a great way to learn, or is a great way to not learn? Do you really know what you're pa pasting code from when you use Stack Overflow? Do you have any idea what the code really does as long as it works? I always have reference libraries instead of Stack Overflow first. Yeah. Yeah. And especially where people are very like, particular. So I, I've always found that it's pretty useful to go through Stack or like having someone explain it to you. As long as it's a good explanation, it's not too big. Mm -hmm. If someone tells me to push buttons, I, I want to probably go dig around and figure out why that works. But if someone says it's Better to have the explanation. So, yeah, no, I'm Stack Overflow. So, so it's interesting. Stack Overflow is a real pain for people, for academics, because often the problems you give to uh, you give the students some Stack Overflow answer exists. So that, that's a real pain. But anyway, um, so. Is it going to contribute to learning or not? We, he's, I don't think he's convinced with all your answers. So, uh, 
So what do I know? I'm not an educationist, right? So educationists have built tutoring systems. And uh, what does a tutoring system do? It's either got intelligent help or manual help. And they've written great papers showing, showing that scaffolding, this is called scaffolding. The scaffolding really helps. And, and, but they haven't necessarily looked at uh, programming courses. They've looked at hypermedia or some medical um, co courses. So we, we can't really say this generalizes. And there's also work in computer-supported cooperative learning. Again, the works I have looked at haven't looked at programming as such. But in general, it seems that help helps in education. Okay. Um, did a little study of our own. Jason uh, was, was going to on the subject. As part of a PhD thesis during his time, things have changed now, you were required to teach a course. So we use that course as, uh, we use all the students as guinea pigs for his, his work. Okay. So what he did was, he provided help through asynchronous email, he provided help through synchronous office hours, plus he had co-located help sessions where people were given, to, uh, where people could do the problems and while they were doing problems they could ask for help and he would give it. He measured how, for six weeks, it, it measured how many times each student used each kind of help. Okay. So he tabulated that, and then he went and correlated that with grades. Now, what do you guys think? Better grades for the better, uh, for more, as help goes up, or help goes, uh, better grades as help goes down? Better, better. better. So. Well. <laughs> So here's what we found. And again, small study, guys. Okay, so the well, point is 35 students. Okay. So um, that's the distribution of help with grades. Okay, we can try to go and average it out with medians. And grade is a function of many things. And what we found was that you can see what's happening. The people who are at the bottom didn't ask for any help. The people who are at the very top are very little help. But the, uh, the, the C, D plus to A minus range, as uh, more help was asked by people who got, as help was uh, increased, the help grade increased. Now what could that mean? That could mean either that better students ask for more help. If you, if you make some progress, you can ask for help, right? If you make no progress, what help can you ask for? Of course, a lot of students come to you and say, I don't you, even know how to start the problem. But at least they try to start the problem. There are many people, people who really do badly in courses are the ones who don't spend time, actually. That's what we figured out. So, uh, or more help improves grades. We don't know which, which is what, but it did go up. Okay, except for the very top students and the very bottom. There's an implication that the, the computer software probably knows what they're doing or has a good understanding of how to follow up that. No, I don't think it's, this one says that. This is saying that help gives uh, the help gives help to everybody. It's just that the very bottom people don't ask for much help, and the very top students don't need much help. Otherwise, help is improved. The grade. That's what this seems to be. This seems to be saying. But you're right. I mean, when you give help to somebody who's understanding your help, that's more useful than somebody who's just uh, doing what you told them. And, 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 and we typically don't tell them the exact solution, right? We give them an abstract. You should. Not all TAs and LAs do that. Students don't come to me because they know they won't get the direct answer. They go to the TAs and LAs. Yeah, that one TA that always gives the solution. Right, right. Because that's the easiest thing to do. Yeah. That's why we need automatic systems. So it does say that giving help doesn't hurt students. And, 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 and to just kind of show you why this is the case, what I found is that students, the reason why students need help often is because of some unintuitive thing in the programming language or the test case I have or the assignment I have. And, and otherwise, they're, they're just fine. And that counterintuitive thing is the one that you have to help them with, and then they can just make progress. Yeah. Yeah. Certain concepts also perform. But it's typically these, these, these counterintuitive things. 
Okay, now we get to the technical issue of, now that we are convinced that you know there is motivation for providing help both in, um, is there a clock here? I have no idea what the time is. It is uh, 3.51. Yeah, 3.51. Okay, so um, um, I've gone 40 minutes actually, okay. So uh, uh, what about technical issues in providing help? So how can we figure out whether somebody needs help, okay? And uh, this is not something you can just come up with the very first time you come up with an algorithm. It's got to be an iterative process, and this is the iterative process we use. Uh, we defined an initial algorithm for predicting the status, which was very naive, and we found that in retrospect, it was pretty, pretty, uh, pretty bad. But we needed an initial algorithm to even get the ground truth. Uh, we implemented the algorithm in a programming environment. We had, uh, uh, we used that to determine ground truth. Um, and then we offline worked with the ground truth and different algorithms offline, not implement the programming environment to figure out how they behave, chose the best algorithm there, and then went and re-implemented the online algorithm, and then worked again offline with the data. So there's the online algorithms and the offline algorithms. Online algorithms, we had just two, a, a trio, right? And offline algorithms, we have plots because that's cheap. Just use Rekha or some uh, system and, and you figure out what features correlate uh, with that, okay? So what are we going to do? Okay, and what is the sort of intuition here? Well, there's two intuitions. Firstly, difficulty has got, to, has got to last. I mean, just because you're having problems with one little statement at one instance doesn't mean you're having difficulty. So when you're playing around, you know, by the time we go and figure out whether you're difficulty or not, you, must, you might have gone over that problem. So we're not going to make uh, inferences in every second. We're going to batch the inferences. Okay. And something about the developer changes. Either their char physical characteristics change, you know, the heartbeat goes up, or, um, or their interaction with the computer changes. Okay. That's the basic intuition. So let's see how we use the first. So we segmented in people's interaction and, and we made predictions per segment rather than per command. Okay, now what should be the segment length? That's a good idea, a good, good question. We found 50 based on the values we found. Okay. So every 50 commands we made a prediction. Okay. That didn't give us very good results. So what we did was we did another level of batching where we made predictions, we, we, we found intermediate predictions for every segment but the final predictions were the majority of predictions within the last five segments. So we went and grouped the segments also into units, which I'm calling uh, blocks. And, and, and in this block, the first block, there were three segments that said progress um, and two that said difficulty. <laughs> I got it wrong. So I should have said progress. So we took the dominant, the dominant uh, uh, prediction. And so that that gave us much better results. So, so, uh, so you guys get that idea here? Now, so you did it in like five, two segments that said in a particular code, or how are you defining the same algorithm? By Eclipse command. So, so we could have used commands or we could have used time. What do you guys think? We didn't use time. Was that a good idea or a bad idea? We could have said every two seconds, every five seconds, every five minutes. Commands are better. Commands are better because? Sorry? I guess people are interested in the time time. I think a lot of people like go ten to the line of code, that be like you get run, you bug, what what is defining the command, I guess? It's like literally eclipse commands. Okay? And and uh, if you're typing in so every time you focus in, focus out, that's a command. Every time you you, know, you navigate you to another place it's a command. Okay, so it's interaction. Interaction commands. Okay. okay. Oh, that's cool. And and insert becomes an issue if I'm typing you know, hello, is that five commands of uh, five insert characters, or is that is that one string? And so we use a tool called Flowrite from CMU that has a little timer in it that decides whether you're doing one string of characters or doing character by character. So it was one one command for that. Okay, okay and so uh, command versus time-based segmentation, you know, I might have just gone for have some coffee. That doesn't mean I was thinking hard about the problem. 
And, and, and so we did it sort of by commands, which is uh, like, you know, when you look at page faults, we look at page faults for access. We don't look at page faults by how much time had elapsed. This is virtual time and physical time. So we looked at basically virtual time. Okay. So now let's come to the second point. What are we? So you can mine physical characteristics and we mine spot things. Okay. I won't get into that because we needed a Kinect camera and Kinect camera is not part of a student's learning environment today. It's not part of a programmer's programming environment today. You can have these heartbeat sensors, skin sensors. They're not part of today's programming environment. So we just, you know, we have a paper on this, but I'm not going to emphasize this very much for practical purposes. Okay. Uh, we mined eclipse actions, okay, and uh, then we went and also mined web accesses. Okay. So these were the two two sensors we used, three sensors we used, but I'll talk about two sensors in, in today's talk. Okay. Uh, so now we get an idea of what commands we were mining, and we were mining edits. This is the first algorithm, or the second algorithm. First one was a really stupid. Um, and we are mining debugs. Okay, debug means you said you hit the run command, you hit break every every breakpoint, um, mm -hmm. step over command, every step into command was a debug command. Uh, every time you focused in and out of a window, okay, that was that we monitored. Every time you navigated, you searched something, you went somewhere else in your code. Uh, we mined that. So does that make sense intuitively? So if I'm making progress, what com what what uh, what commands will go up if? Edits. And if I'm not making progress, what's going to go up? All of those things, right? So that makes perfect intuition for sense, right? And we went and basically found ratios. So we've said how many commands were put in a, in a segment, how many commands of a, in a particular kind. So the latter divided by the former was a ratio. So this is segment independent then. We got these features that were independent of segment. And if you, if you plot this, you really see uh, there are two different plots. In one case, the difficulties, the edit commands really go down very quickly. The green is the edit commands. The rest of them are the other commands. And you see that the green commands go down during difficulty. And the other commands, one or the other, goes up. Okay. So uh, now there's a lot of machine algorithms to try. Okay. Now, uh, rem remember that we have this minority problem that we have very few difficulties and lots of progress. If you're gonna train a machine learning, learning pro 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 program algorithm, you just can't work with these things. So there, there are ways to solve the problem. One of them is this fix, thing called SMORT, where you best basically, uh, I won't say replicate, but you uh, artificially add new, new uh, instances of the minority class. So minority class here happens to be difficulty. So based on the current difficulty points, we synthesize new points and, and, and we equalize them, and that's the SMORT. Uh, algorithm. So we found the decision tree plus SMORT seemed to work the best. And we built a system, both for Visual Studio and Eclipse. Um, and they both uh, use some common modules. But, and the common modules are the ones that are interesting. There's the event aggregator, which goes and aggregates the events into segments. There's the feature extractor that takes a segment and goes and finds a, uh, makes a prediction based on a, a current model. And then the status aggregator, which takes predictions from adjacent segments and decides whether it's a difficulty or not. Okay. And um, we built a system that allows somebody to go and uh, see, the, see the status and correct the status by saying making progress, say slow progress, or I'm not sure. And uh, we also created a helper view where each helper, potential helper could see who's in difficulty um, and and uh, who's not in difficulty, and if somebody's in difficulty, you could actually see their edits in real time to see what they were up to. Uh, uh, you can collaborate with them in real time uh, in the sense of sending messages. We used email, but you could see their actions in real time. So there's difficulty notification, status display, okay, and view project button, and you could see their. And again, the students from Jason's class were the guinea pigs here. So the one question was, how many of them would, would, adopt, would actually sign the IRB form and actually take part in the study? So if you were a student, would you be willing to try this tool out? Sure, right? 
So people said, hey, we're getting help. Who's going to, 30 out of 35 students said yes. Okay, five said no, for whatever reason. So, we, you know, this was a real flop. We can't just play around with them and, 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 and take risks. So the first thing we did was try to have no risks. So we went in, asked them to manually indicate the need for help. Okay, whenever they're in difficulty, we said press a button. Uh, only one student went and pressed the slow progress button. Okay? And that's surprising, surprising because people did need help. So why was this the case? They did not want to bother the instructor uh, by saying, when you say I need help, I mean, you're saying, you know, give, you're, you're intruding. They were not sure the instructor was there. They were programming away at home, so they don't know if there's somebody around to listen to them. And sometimes when they're in difficulty, they didn't press the button. And this is consistent with other people who've shown that uh, often, often uh, people don't ask. So now the instructor said, okay, these are the times I'll be around. And what, did that, what happened then? Students just asked for help when they didn't even need it. Okay? So there was over use of their button. So that didn't work out well either. So we finally said, okay, there's a reason to have our system. So we turned on difficulty detection announced times when people would, uh, the help would be provided, but they didn't have to press a button. And the question now was that here you're typing away and somebody says, hey, do you need help? And we know that sometimes this happens when you go to web pages, right? People say, do you need some help? And we were wondering whether they'd, they'd get freaked out by that, creeped out by that. And as it turns out, students said, no, we knew that we could be given help. We were prepared for that, so we, they didn't get unnerved by requests for help. And what happened then was when, when Jason found out that somebody needs, is in difficulty, he would ask them, are you in difficulty? They would go into an email discussion, so it was slow, it was not just this instant messaging at that thing. And, and uh, he would give them either references to background material or a description of how specific errors could be fixed. So he didn't really hold their hands completely. And help was given nine times to eight students in the last three assignments. Okay, so this was turned on for last three assignments and this, and, and every time the tool detected that there was difficulty, the student was in difficulty. But lots of difficulties were missed. Okay? So uh, no false positives, but students come, came later to office hours with difficulties they had faced the previous day and the tool hadn't caught them. So that tells you the false positive and false positive negative. And here's an example. The instructor says, do you need help? The student says, yes, I'm having a few problems getting an error messages from Eclipse to be solved. And he says, okay, why don't you go and re read up the uh, stuff on methods and parameters and how parameters are supposed to be passed to procedures. And the person says, oh, thank you so much. That took me, I, I, I was struggling with this problem quite a bit. Okay? So this is just the kind of help that this was promoted. And students were appreciative of the help provided. Even when, uh, they also liked, you know, being computer science students, they liked that there was a tool. Uh, so this was cool, which was good, okay? Uh, and, and it's not all positive. Here was a student who tried to explain the problem and just couldn't explain the problem and couldn't get the help they needed remotely, okay? Because, and, and the real problem was that they couldn't really point to the something in the screen to say what the problem was. So I come from the CSCW background. Surely we could have anticipated that they would need some screen sharing, okay? And we did. So before we're offering our tool and before even building our tool, we said, would you be screen sharing? And if I was to say to you, would you, as a student, would you be willing to sh uh, do screen sharing? What would you say? Sure? No, no one was willing. Yep. But when you're doing your homework? Yeah, well, every Friday, I'll get contracted during the office. So remember, screen sharing when you want help is different from screen sharing oh, where no. somebody can at any time look at what your screen is doing. Okay, so that makes sense. Oh, okay. yeah. Because remember, this is a difficulty inference system. I infer you're having difficulty, I look at your screen, I see what's going on. So this is not, uh, this, this is a little different. So basically he said, I don't want you looking at my Eclipse Facebook page. We told them, 
Okay, we'll record only the eclipse window, nothing else. Still no tape. Okay. However, after we had given them help without screen sharing, we asked this question again. Would you now be willing to share the screen? Half the students were now willing to do this. And they said, now they trusted the, they, they trusted the instructor and uh, they figured out why screen sharing was good. Okay. So that's academics. Now let me ask you guys. If I was to say, this is the experience I have, would you be willing to deploy this tool within your organization? Uh, okay. No? No? Okay, so you don't trust my system. You say, you're saying, look, this, this, this may work for beginning programmers, but for real programmers who've gone past, got a BS from Chapel Hill or any other place, we are, we are too good, we are too good to be detected by you. <laughs> okay, so, so th there's, you just don't trust the tool to work for that, and that's fair enough. But I'm talking about, would you be willing to test the tool? And he tried that. He tried to uh, um, contact industry teams. And, you know, managers don't want to use an untested tool in their job, for sure. Okay? So we couldn't get any takers to try our tool out. So when you have radical co-location, a tool like this is less useful, right? Because you can already see the problems your collaborators face. So our whole goal was to make sure that even when you don't have radical co-location, you can have the benefits of radical co-location. And actually, we are going beyond radical co-location. I mean, this is a very big area here. You might not know what the person diagonally sitting opposite in that room is facing. So here, if you had my tool, and you could detect the difficulty there, then you can just walk over and help them without running into this you know, screen sharing and Eclipse window situation. So, so even in that situation, I believe this would be useful. Yeah, yeah, no, no. So, I, so no, you guys would just use it within your industry that your manager would help the intern and yeah. it wouldn't come to us. Exactly, exactly. That's what I'm talking about. Okay? Untested tool, un unsanitized tool. So what we did was, we did the next best thing. We went to interview people in the industry and said, would you use this tool if you had all these problems solved? Okay? And we looked at, uh, uh, and, and you know, so uh, we asked each pair, can you give examples of where this tool might have helped in the past and where it might help in the future? And... Uh, all pairs of uh, mentor, we looked at mentor and intern pairs, and, and both mentors and interns liked the idea. It, it was once one intern said, he liked the idea that his mentor could be watching over his shoulder. And a mentor said, I don't have to come up with all these meetings to find out if people have difficulties. I can just know when difficulties occur without having to schedule all these meetings. Okay, so that's the experience there, but I don't know whether you guys relate to that or not, but that showed so difficulty detection is possible and useful, and there's this privacy issue, which has to be solved. Um, first, privacy in terms of you know that the tool pass off security checks, and second, do I really want my manager to know to see what I'm doing? And it seems that in industrial environments, things are anyway so open. You're not looking at Facebook. You're not supposed to be looking at Facebook anyway. So uh, whereas in, in academic environments, when you're when you're at home, you're doing homework, you're socializing. So it's a little different situation. Okay, I, I've spent an hour. I can spend, I guess, I, I think I've got about 10 minutes more left. Are you guys fine? So let me answer her question, okay? That, um, 
will this tool even work for somebody, some real programming? Uh, forget this 401 stuff. She took a 401 that was a very diluted 401. Had she taken my 401, she would know that it was beyond what you're probably doing right now. <laughs> 401 is our second programming course, okay? Uh, and I'm kind of joking when I say she took a, she took a diluted 401. Uh, so, you know, given that you have stack overflow with you, you're not saying do a bubble sort, which is to be done in, that was every 110, which was even before 401, the course I was talking about, CS1 versus CS2. Uh, so let's say that you have the whole web to, to provide help, uh, to get help from. You are, you have gone and interned at companies, you're, or you're an industrial worker yourself. And uh, how does this this stuff work there? How can we improve up our, our true positives and negatives? Okay. So this is where we go now to ac uh, mining web accessory also. So we we add a new sensor where we actually mine. Uh, we did it with and without web accesses, but now we also look at how often you're going to the to, to, to the to the web. Okay. Um, this whole web-based programming idea has been studied quite a bit. Uh, people have looked at the <coughs> cost. You know, so you might say that when there's when you have a web, difficulties go away. Mm -hmm. No, when you get a page, you have there's a co certain cost of correcting the fix. Okay. Okay. So people have looked at what is the cost of different kinds of web pages? You know, Stack Overflow versus a Wikipedia article. Okay, Stack Overflow is going to be easier to uh, look for information than a Wikipedia article, which is going to give you things more indirectly. So there's some work, work done there. There's work done in providing a good UI to do web foraging. Um, there's also some work from Canada on recommending to you web pages that you yourself have visited previously. Okay. Uh, so there's this work, we've put difficulty detection into the picture, and we've done work on programming difficulties with no web accesses. Okay, I just talked about that work. People have done, uh, and actually some people at UNC, have looked at uh, the problem of searching the web without doing programming or non-programming tasks. So where our contribution comes is in looking at web-based programming and looking at difficulties in web-based programming. So we have an algorithm that works without the web. How do we add web accesses to it? We did the most obvious, simple thing one could think of. We said, let's just go and see how many web pages were visited in, the, in a second. That, that's the only extra feature we have. Okay. So what do you guys think? Will, it, will more web page visits correlate with difficulty or Inverse or? It also depends on the firewall. I know there are some programmers who are using more of a rest feature that only exists in your browser for a time. There are still areas of your navigation you use as well. I would argue that it depends on what you're trying to do, whether it's you're looking like Stack Overflow for general solution, or you're going to, let's say, like C++.com, where you're looking at the library and how the library is handled. So you're saying the answer depends. And always, you know, in computer science, whenever the students, I ask students a question, the answer always depends. You know, it's always a good answer. So try to go and correlate that with other co other features. Absolutely. Let's say it's kind of like time to where web page access doesn't necessarily correlate to the difficulty. Like you're saying, yeah, I'll be looking at this time and you know, some random thing will break. Same thing where you know some might stop for a second when something else stops. Yeah, so we, we never look at time. We never look at time. We look at segments of commands. So we say within the last 50 commands, how many web pages access did you have? Okay. So anyway, what was the task? The task was to build use Swing to create a GUI. Okay. And I won't get into the details of that, but this was this was a hard enough task for that very few people actually completed it perfectly, despite the fact that they were all advanced students and had done internships. So this is what we found. And this is with the features that we found the true positive rate went from 20 to 93. Okay. But the true negative rate we found went from 100 to 95. So we were flagging many non-difficulties as difficulties, but we also got more difficulties. So this is a classic trade-off. But it seems these numbers seem to indicate that the web pages were fantastic. But they're kind of misleading. Because if we look at recall and precision, which is a better measure here, 
they see a, a, a much truer st story. The precision is the, tr is the true negative rate. And uh, in one case, we uh, found, uh, sorry, sorry, the, uh, the uh, right, the, the recall uh, went, went from 20 to 93, and the precision went from 95 to 54. So we, only 54% of the difficulties were really difficult. Whereas uh, earlier it was, uh, uh, sorry, what am I, I'm comparing, it went from 100 to 54. Earlier we had, um, we were always correct when we said it was a difficulty. And now only 54% of the difficulties. Okay, so there's a trade off. Okay, and, and that happens to be, <coughs> sometimes where pages help, Sometimes they help. Okay, that's that, that that's the, that's what we figured out. So, and the reason why the the, the uh, precision is uh, is a better measure than um, the true negative rate is because only six percent of segments were uh, diff labeled difficult. So, this five percent was a very large number when it comes to the difficulties. Uh, so, that five percent we missed was a very large. Okay. So, you you had a question. So what does this mean? It means that, look, if I, so what would you guys want to want? You, do you want more prime gold? Or do, you, do you want a higher cost precision or higher recall? Both. <laughs> if you're, if you, you know, life would, life would be too boring if, if we could meet all our requirements at the same time. So. So you're saying, you're saying there's probably avenues to improve this. Absolutely, absolutely. That's why I told you we took the most stupid thing we could think of to see whether it made a difference. This is very, this is an undergrad did this work. So this is very, this is very new. So that's where- No, but I want to just go and say, if you had to make a choice between true positive rate and true negative rate, which would you choose? And my instinct was, our first algorithm, I liked it, because it's strictly better than the state of the art. If you believe it's numbers, it never flags a difficulty wrong. Today, if you are in difficulty, I don't get to know, right? With my system, 20% of the time I get to know that you are in difficulty without getting any false negatives. That's fantastic. At least it's better than the state of the art. And if you're doing homework, and I'm trying to, you know, and, and, and I, I'm doing my homework, and I go out of the way to help you, and both of us are disturbed, that's bad. But if I'm in a classroom and we're trying to solve all these problems together in a training session, like I saw today, then if, if this is a false negative, so big deal. You just walked over to, you know, to, to the seat here. It doesn't matter. There it matters more that you catch as many difficulties as possible, even though some of them are false alarms. So that's my sort of take, that in face-to-face -face training sessions, you can use one algorithm. In, in uh, homework, uh, uh, with, with a heavier cost of helping, you could use one. This thing called F measure that tries to provide a balance. That's his both kind of thing. Based on the F measure, we did better with the axis. Okay. Um, so um, I, I think I think uh, I think I've taken a lot of time, and and uh, let me just quickly go through this. So why wh why did the web axis help? Uh, you know, there are times when there is no programming activity at all. You're just dumb. So at that point, you know, looking at web access it gives you information because you are entering no commands, and yet you're in difficulty. So commands are not going to give you enough help. Uh, now we had this focus ratio, which told you every time you switched out of the Eclipse environment. Couldn't you have told, could that have told you that you're going to the web? Well, not quite. When you go to the Eclipse, you can make five web accesses or one web access, we don't know. And you can go to the web, uh, out of the web, out of Eclipse, even when, uh, and not go to the browser, go to some other window. So that is why the focus ratio was not enough, and we needed web accesses. And uh, would web accesses alone have been sufficient? No, 17% of difficulties had no web accesses. Okay, so some difficulties are just logic difficulties. Uh, there, there's nothing to, there's, you know, you can't, you can't use web accesses again. Okay. So uh, this was the basic problem that sometimes the web offered help, 
sometimes they copied code from Stack Overflow, didn't understand what it was doing, and spent all their time trying to, trying to get rid of the errors that pasting code introduced into the Eclipse environment. And that's when they were different. They didn't know what instance of a particular interface to create uh, to get rid of the uh, assignment uh, uh, operation. So that was the reason why sort of we had to. Okay, just to give you an idea, how many of you guys have actually done some GUI programming? Okay. So you might think that, you know, what's so hard about GUI programming? I mean, people invented toolkits to make it easy. As it turns out, they're not so easy. And painting, 2D graphics was the most difficult thing, by the way. So there goes your 401 argument that, uh, you know, when you're in industry, so I'm going to argue that when you're in industry, you need help more. And I'll tell you why. When it comes to teaching programming, there are some very good textbooks, there are good compiled errors, there are ex excellent sources to solve your problem. When you use, uh, when industry, you have to use APIs that are A, not well designed, unintuitive, not documented, constantly changing, so you're going to have much more, many more gotchas than if you're going to uh, program in a time-tested environment. So, so my argument, I spend time, so much time, I, I, I go and change Eclipse, and I have no idea how to go and do this as a, in an Eclipse plugin. There's nobody in Stack Overflow who knows that answer too. So wouldn't it be nice if I knew somebody else who had the same problem, and, and, and I could get help from them, okay, if I could. Brings me to my, my I'm, I'm ending here, where I would like to go next from here is not only provide automation in finding difficulties, but automation in finding solutions. So when I'm trying to do this Eclipse plugin and trying to go and figure out how to create a fine dialogue automatically, programmatically, somebody else who's done the same thing and had difficulty, I can go and see their code come to me rather than me going to stack. So what, how, how does Stack Overflow work? I have a problem. I have to first articulate it, and if I don't articulate it well, people are going to shout at me. And then I have to go and give the full context, and somebody has to read it, somebody has to remember their context, and give you the answer. Wouldn't it be nice if we all programming away, we all being monitored, okay, we don't mind doing that being happening. Every time there's a difficulty, some system notes down what the difficulty was, some system notes down what we did to our program to fix the difficulty, and next time I have a problem, my problem is correlated with your problem, and your solution is given to me, either directly, or maybe you got help from some TA or some other human being, and that English post is given to me. That's kind of my dream. Whether it is programming in Java, whether it is doing shell programming, whether it's in Python programming, or whether it is registering for a course at UNC, which apparently is not so easy to do using the web interfaces. Is, is, that, is that true, maybe? Of the so, so that's kind of my vision. And, and uh, Juan mentioned that we have a new NSF project that has to do with uh, data science. The data scientists have to use a lot of uh, command line tools. Or they have to build workflows. And command line tools are one way to build workflows. They're called pipes. And, and uh, these guys are not proficient in computer, in computer science. And even computer science programmers often don't have shell tools. So we want to go and focus on just training sessions and provide automatic hands-on training for, pe for people with disabilities. Not preemptively, it, 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 is, it is connected to our difficulty sensing tool. Okay. Only when it senses you have difficulty, you can press the button to say, give me recommendation. Okay. So and so Stack Overflow comes to you rather than you going to Stack Overflow. So I mean, look, look, this is a dream, okay? I can dream anything. And, 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 but here's where I think that we can do better than Stack Overflow. We have the full context of what you've been doing. Stack Overflow is based on what somebody went and pasted on, in that page. And, and, and so that's, we have, we have far more information. And right now we want to just restrict ourselves to training sessions. 
where the world is much more regular. They're all solving the same problem, yet they're having problems, <coughs> difficulties, and the chance of finding a solution is very, very high there. My ultimate dream is that you know, whenever you're using a Spring API, whether you're doing it for a training session or building an API, uh, building, uh, building a real application, uh, I can provide you with some problems. In fact, why maybe Spring and some other toolkit, they have some similar ideas. The idea of a paint method exists in everything, everywhere. So that's done by a single thread. So maybe solutions can, 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 can translate. So I'm just saying, this is sort of my big vision and dream, which people aren't working for. And I, I want to sort of give talk to get people in, into this, yeah. Yeah, the decision tree algorithm was machine learning. Oh. And we haven't explored the whole space of decision tree algorithms either, uh, of, of machine learning algorithms either. But yeah, that was all machine learning. So that's the idea that based, we learn. So we don't know the solution to your training exercises. I can go into your training exercise downstairs and say, use my system without knowing anything about your system, as long as I can correlate your, your solutions and decisions. So, you know, if you had lots of data. Which you can remove. Yeah. Uh, let's just say if you had. Let's not say th th whether you're right or not about that. Okay? If we had enough data, we could use neural networks. We could use a lot of deep learning stuff. We don't have to go and think hard about the features. We don't have to think about choosing between decision trees and Bayesian networks. Okay? Now, let's talk about MOOCs. If I could go and instrument the MOOCs the way I want them to be instrumented, I could get a lot of data. So, Philip Gore, for instance. The reason why I wanted to collaborate with him was that he's got a MOOC that people use a lot. And there was a guy who went and collaborated with him, a guy from NC State, a guy called Chris, and they had this button that they, people could press, I'm frustrated button. And they tried to figure out whether they could correlate the frustration with something about the program they were writing. So they found that certain kinds of Java constructs were more conducive to frustration. Okay? But what we would want is the logs of action. And we'd have to go and get some MOOC guys to buy into our system to get that, to get, to have, a, and also we rely very much on manual help. I really don't want to give you the exact code to solve your problem. I, I mean, that just goes against every principle I have. So I want to do this in, a, in an environment where the student or the programmer or the instructor can get manual help. I want to record that help and replay the help to somebody else with the same problem. In MOOCs, there is no manual intervention at all. By definition, you cannot provide manual help to individual users. Okay, you can have four of them, but we can't provide you with manual assistance and asynchronous collaboration with the person. So that is one limitation. The MOOC can give you logs and could give you very It could give you all the difficulties they face. Just implement them. Yes, and then who's gonna, you know, I have to go and tie up with uh, Udacity, or I have to tie up. No, no, but they use some certain platforms. Yeah. I have to tie up with the platform. No, Coursera doesn't have a platform. But then you have like Udacity has platform. But anyway, if you have some ideas and if you know people who will be willing to mod modify uh, modify the MOOCs, just let me know. But Philip Go is the first guy to sort of go, to, go okay. towards that. And, and I'm, I'm hoping that we can do that.
Yeah, you know, so uh, Jason Carter is actually working at Cisco right now. And people, they want to set a spec sheet. For spec sheets, they want to design. Uh, design, see the thing is that, uh, it could go to design too. The thing is that I want to do things that I understand. I don't understand the design tools that you guys use in the industry. I use, I learn programming, you know, like they said, make flowcharts first and then write the programs, and I always go to programs first, then make the flowcharts later. So I never kind of bought that, bought into that way of programming. And, and so uh, I have to feel things in my bones. So I'm thinking of going towards, uh, towards writing, believe it or not, since we do a lot of writing in our thing. So we had one student trying to figure out whether people are having difficulty with writing and to provide them with help with that. Spreadsheets, so there's a guy at NC State who's done some studies with problems people have with their spreadsheets. I want to, I've got their logs, so if some student gets interested, I want to look at solving problems with, uh, with getting spreadsheets, which is also a form of programming. But at the design level, we're talking about the architecture level and English documents, I mean, what do I have? I have inserts, deletes, I just don't have much semantics there, right? So that becomes a little trickier, and I really don't know how that goes, even though I spent some time in Microsoft. Other questions? Okay, thank you very okay, much. Okay, thank you.